On the third anniversary of the sneak Jap attack, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz addresses officers and men and civilian war workers of Pearl Harbor. This date, the 7th of December, and this site, the Pearl Harbor Navy Yard, are a fitting time and place for me to tell you that all six of the Japanese aircraft carriers that opened this war by attacking us here three years ago now lie at the bottom of the sea. If I recall to you a bit of the history of another ghost fleet, I refer to those American warships that lay hurt, some of them on the bottom of this harbor, three years ago this noon. Most of this ghost fleet, which our enemy said was sunk or damaged beyond repair, is today haunting our enemy in a most unghostlike fashion. The battleships Pennsylvania, Maryland, Tennessee, California, and West Virginia. That list will seem ironic to the Japanese Admiralty because if you add to these five the name of the Mississippi, you have the exact list of battleships that lined up across Surigao Strait shortly before dawn on October 25th and sent all eight Japanese warships opposing them to the bottom. Sighting certain cruisers and destroyers by name, ships sunk or damaged at Pearl Harbor, Admiral Nimitz expressed great pride in the fact that most of these ships have been sent back into action. Others, he said, were used as parts or even scrap for building and reconditioning units of our fleets. The job is not finished. The road to Tokyo is long and arduous, and we must tread it together all the way. Until that day, however far distant, when Japan shall cease to exist as a threat to our civilization, I have but one message. We must all carry on. Elements of a U.S. infantry regiment map operations at Tonkwa. Part of the Mars task force, they set up defensive positions at a point 65 miles south of Bamo and 120 miles north of Mandalay. The task force marched through 200 miles of dense jungle before coming into contact with the enemy in mid-December. At the time these scenes were photographed, last Japs were still dug in outside Tonkwa. Men of Weapons Platoon, Headquarters Company, 2nd Battalion, prepare a position for emplacing a 4.2 mortar. The logs are from wrecked native huts. Enemy troops in a rice paddy are subjected to the mortar fire. Each company, second battalion flushes Japs out of a wooded area. Sustained fire forces the enemy into an open field. Our troops employ a captured Jap knee mortar. The captured Jap 25 light Nambu fires alongside our caliber 30 heavy machine gun. As the firing ceases, patrols cautiously reconnoiter the area and find many enemy dead. Wounded American troops are evacuated by Burmese ox carts. They are to be taken to Mole Lane, three miles to the north, from whence they will be flown out by L-5s. In a year-end report, Lieutenant General Daniel I. Sultan announced that in 10 weeks of Burma operations by Chinese-American troops and British forces, 4,000 Japs had been killed and 9,000 square miles of territory retaken. The 
XC-97, an Army Air Force's answer to problems of long-range, high-volume transportation. Practically a B-29 with a double fuselage, it was first flight tested on 9th November 1944. Two months later, it broke all records in the large airplane class by flying from Seattle to Washington in six hours, three minutes, and 50 seconds. Three separate compartments in two decks give it nearly as much cargo space as two railroad boxcars. A ramp, which can be extended or retracted in less than a minute, is motivated by a monorail lift. This electric traverse hoist operates the full length of the main cabin on the upper deck. The hoist is used for direct lifting, load positioning, and towing. The ramp is adjustable in width and slope to accommodate vehicles of various tread and height. The entire fuselage is pressurized to maintain 4,000 foot atmospheric pressure up to 22,000 feet. According to Boeing figures, the fuselage has a total volume of 7,066 cubic feet, of which 89% can be used for cargo. Illustrating a few of many loading possibilities. The C-97 can carry 134 fully equipped infantrymen. Range, 1,820 miles. Another possibility, two Type T9E1 tanks, 500 gallons of gasoline for the armored vehicles, and 25 fully equipped troops. Range, 770 miles. Another combination, 75 litter casualties, four medical personnel, litters, and medical supplies. The C-97 can fly this load 3,500 miles. Lower compartment doors swing to the ground, making their self-contained stairs available for rapid personnel loading. The transport has the same wingspan as the B-29, but is 11 feet longer and has a 5 foot greater overall height. This X model is powered by four 2,200 horsepower engines, but production specifications call for engines of 2,450 horsepower. 320 miles per hour is the present cruising speed. Boeing engineers expect to add 30 miles to that. By way of comparison, the Lockheed C-69 has a range of 3,700 miles. The C-47, 1,550. The XC-97 has a maximum range on built-in tankage of 5,173 miles. Coast Guard operation. Objective, to destroy Nazi radio and weather reporting installations on the northeast coast of Greenland. Lowering a scout plane for reconnaissance. At one point, when an enemy trawler was sighted, a 70-mile chase through great ice flows ensued as the Nazi vessel twisted in intricate maneuvers to escape. Out of a task force of four cutters, two chased the fleeing vessel. The Northland and Storis shown here. Guns open fire on the German trawler. Their ship scuttled, this group of Nazis surrenders, climaxing the 70 mile pursuit. Included among the prisoners were eight officers and 20 enlisted men. The Coast Guard mission began in July 1944 when the Greenland Sledge Patrol, composed of Danish nationals, discovered evidence of a Nazi station near Cape Susi. These Navy films were taken during more than two months of operations through ice-packed waters. Probing the icy waters for additional quarry, a Fokka wolf attached to the Nazi expeditions is sighted. The plane veers off to the east and disappears.
our position is 800 miles below the North Pole. Boats are lowered for a dawn attack on Little Caldaway Island. The two platoon force of sailors is from the cutter East Wind. Their objective, a Nazi radio and weather station, source of valuable weather gathering data transmitted to Berlin for use in operations throughout the Northern European theater. These latest skirmishes are the northernmost engagements to have taken place in this hemisphere. Several months prior to the landing, an army combat crew searching the area of Cape Soucy found a Nazi base hastily abandoned and burned. Coldaway's base, however, was found intact. The station is finally liquidated as three officers and nine enlisted men surrender. A total of 60 prisoners were taken during the two months' operations. The job had to be done during the relatively short period when ships are able to operate through the shifting flows of the Arctic Ocean. During most of the year, the northern seas are covered over with ice. Mission accomplished. Northern Europe's weather originates and moves eastward from here. So the Nazis had equipped this valuable base with a large amount of scientific and radio equipment, which is removed to the Cutter East Wind. Another ship in the Arctic mission was the South Wind. The Cutter Northland made the first American capture of Nazis September 1941. Destroyed in the current operation were three German expeditions. <laughs> Snowbound at the 94th Evacuation Hospital, 5th Army Front. Christmas 1944 weather report. Below freezing temperature, often accompanied by heavy mist and fog. These scenes are typical of conditions all along the virtually stalemated battle line south of Bologna. With the 1st Armored Division, where weather aggravated terrible difficulties of the Apennine mountain terrain. Snowed in or bogged down units could be seen along the whole Italian front, from the Ligurian to the Adriatic Sea. Fighting in this particular sector is limited to patrol activities. Hazardous, ice-covered Highway 65. Gravel is strewn in an effort to make the roads less hazardous. But all up and down highways crossing the Apennines, traffic by day and by night is a constant strain on drivers maintaining the supply lines. This 60-inch, 8 million candle power searchlight is one of a battery of lights used by the 351st Anti-Aircraft Artillery during the pitch-dark winter nights to create a moonlight effect, giving better visibility over our network of roads near the front lines. Directed skyward, the powerful beams cast a ceiling of light over highways sheathed in ice. This improvisation has resulted in speedier and safer road transportation. Winter holds a firm grip everywhere along the European fronts. Here on the German frontier, in the Ardennes during the Battle of the Bulge, and in Italy, our troops face not only the Nazis, but also a second enemy, trench foot. Medical surveys reveal that while great strides have been made toward care and prevention on the part of the individual soldier, trench foot still constitutes a major menace. Second only to the hazards of combat are the hazards of exposure to the continent's snow and mud. Medical stations behind the lines are filling up with a variety of casualties directly attributed to the weather, including serious frostbite. But most pressing are the cases of trench foot, a very painful condition that sometimes results in the loss of a part or all of the feet. Continued exposure to cold and mud in wet trenches or foxholes with restricted movement and wearing of wet socks and footgear for many days without change are typical causes of this disability. Prevention is easily described, if not always easy to accomplish. A change of socks and drying the feet at least once a day will help ward off trench foot. 
If this is impossible, the medics recommend that the soldier take off his shoes and socks, exercise his feet, and wring out the socks. Trench foot can have prolonged effects. Even in less serious cases, the feet may be very tender and painful for a long time. January in the Ardennes. Heavy fog blankets the northern flank of the bulge as Lieutenant General Courtney Hodge's first army begins a general offensive against von Rundstedt's Belgian lines. This bad break in the weather deprives our forces of bomber support and curtails all aerial observation. Biting cold, snow and rain turn to ice, play havoc with supply routes and delay deployment of armored units. Tank treads skid like skates. Faggots are used to give better traction. Similar conditions prevail on virtually every road behind the battle lines. According to reports, some of the motorized equipment slid into roadside ditches, often tearing down telephone lines as it went. But despite the worst weather of the winter, General Hodge's counteroffensive gains momentum. The veteran 82nd Airborne Division moves along a five-mile front. Units of a parachute regiment attack German positions in wooded country near Arberfontein, nine miles southwest of Stavolo. West of these troops, infantry and armored teams operate on a 12-mile front. The 83rd Infantry combines with the 3rd Armored Division, commanded by Major General Maurice Rose. General Rose confers over the opening of a drive aimed at cutting the La roche saint vite Highway. Wreckage of earlier clashes in the Battle of the Bulge is piled up along the approaches to the vital road junction. An infantry patrol brings in a group of German SS men and paratroopers captured in ground fighting just ahead of the armored column. Several prisoners wear items of GI clothing. This one has our leggings. Another wears a pair of OD trousers. At La Fosse, Belgium, men of the 2nd Armored Division move through the streets on the double as the enemy attacks. The 2nd Armored is teamed with the 84th Infantry on the right flank of the sector. A tank also takes cover. The two-pronged advance is down the manai ufalis bastogne Road and further west toward La Roche. Dead Nazis are passed en route. remains of tank weapons and tanks, destroyed by the Allies as a precaution against their recapture by infiltrating enemy patrols. All of this equipment is beyond repair after point-blank hits by a tank destroyer at Champs, Belgium, three miles northeast of Bastogne. Supreme Headquarters estimates that up to 11th January, the Germans lost more than 600 tanks and assault guns in their Belgian campaign. On the Luxembourg half of the salient, the 35th Division attacks a large fortified house. This attack is before the town of Arlange, five miles southeast of Bastogne. Enemy positions westward to Saint-Hubert are under siege as Lieutenant General George S. Patton's 3rd Army closes pockets containing thousands of enemy troops. Firing ceases, a wounded Nazi lies in a foxhole. He was given first aid by our troops. Another wounded German is removed by litter bearers as the bulge shrinks before the Allied onslaught. 